Let's take our Bibles and open them to Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, and as you're doing that, and as we prepare to look at a couplet of verses, let me give you a few images that will help you process the two verses we're going to dissect this morning, all right? The images are these. Think of a seed in the sense that a seed has something that grows up from it and something that grows down from it. A tree with its fruit or foliage would be on top and yet there are roots below and yet all of that comes from the central activity, at least initially, of the seed. So it kind of goes both directions. Think perhaps of a, a hinge. And a hinge enables a door to swing two ways. You could say you're going out or you could say you're coming in. And so a hinge serves uh, multi-directions. Or perhaps think of a funnel. Something goes into a funnel, lots of things, but it kind of is filtered down to where what comes out goes into another direction. And so in both of these, in, in all three of these instances or images, you have like multi-directions. Um, you have a central place where something comes in and goes out or swings or grows. I think those images will help you understand the placement of the first two verses of Ephesians 5. In which I think if you were to pour all of like chapter 4 verses 17 through 32 into a funnel, it's going to kind of basically end up at Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, but there's still more to come out. And so chapter 5 kind of unfolds with more information. You know, what's poured in is how we're different this new self we're putting on, the, the old self we're putting off, these traits and habits that are, that are, that are created after God's own likeness and, and holiness. In other words, we're different. And then it kind of all summarized in this in these couple of verses where it says we're walking in love because Christ loved us. And then it flows into chapter five, this, this new sexual ethic that's, uh, that is owned by the Christian. So it's kind of like a funnel. It could be a hinge that there's a door that's swinging. And chapter four is one way and chapter five is another way, but they're all tied to this hinge, perhaps as a seed. So there's a lot that's growing from chapter five, verses one and two in both directions. Chapter four springs out of it. Chapter five springs out of it. What you're gonna see is that this call to general holiness, this uh, listing of particular conduct uh, in chapter four, as well as what's ahead in chapter 5, it's all sourced by what's discussed in chapter 5, 1 and 2. So I hope those images and, and that brief introduction has helped you kind of grasp what I think is to be the, the central focus of a large section in Ephesians, probably running from chapter 4 all the way through much of chapter 5. This set of verses this morning will serve as the foundation, the seed, the hinge um, the funnel for all that's coming in and all that's going out. Showing us that there is a different way to live. Chapters four and five show us that. But the, the reason we can live differently is because we've been loved differently. I think that's really the, the gist of verses one and two. In fact, here's what I'll bring to you as our take home realization off the bat. You'll see this surface in these two verses. Let's get it on the table early and let's watch it kind of emerge point by point. We're going to see that a different kind of life, which is really what chapter 4 discussed and what 5 will unfold as well. But this different kind of life is rooted in a different kind of love, namely God's love. So will you say this with me together? Let's go church. A different kind of life is rooted in a different kind of love, God's. That's our take-home realization. I want you to watch it unfold with me in this couplet of verses from Ephesians chapter 5. I'll go to our lab today. We'll look at it here. Have your journals ready. Have your Bibles ready. Mark them up. Take good notes. And I hope what you'll see is this very realization, this truth just unfolding in front of us as we investigate these two verses. So here's, here's Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Can we read these out loud together? Just like we did our take-home realization. Let's read these two verses uh, in, in unison together. 
Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, what a rich set of verses. Amen, church? And as we begin to look at this set of verses about God's love for us, I, I just want you to know there'll be moments that I'll be speechless and tongue-tied. I have the immense pleasure of really preaching to you this morning on the love of God, which is every pastor and preacher's delight. But it's an impossible task. Uh, as we dive into it, and I've had you know, multiple weeks to just uh, meditate on these verses, you just get overwhelmed quickly. Um, you get... Um, dumbfounded easily because God's love is so rich and expansive and beautiful and amazing. I hope that you find your heart multiple times today just beating out of spiritual rhythm, we'll call it, because you just can't believe this is actually how God loves you. And it's out of this love that we are to walk. In fact, let me just show you this briefly, can I? What you're going to find in these two verses, there are two imperatives. There is the Imperative to be imitators of God, and then there's the imperative to walk in love. These are the only two um, commands in this set of verses. And so all that we read about in these verses are really descriptors or modifiers of God's love for us, which is really what he's calling us to imitate. He says to be mim uh, mimics of God. That's the word imitate. It's the Greek word mimetai. We get our word mimic from it. So he's calling upon us to imitate God. When he says walk in love, the point is God is a God of love. We're his beloved children. So he's asking us to imitate God's love in an external way. As we walk among others, we're to walk among them in love because that's the way we've been loved. So he's asking us, watch this, I think to see something first. See how God has loved you because you can't copy something you've not already viewed, right? You can't imitate what you haven't experienced. So he's saying, first and foremost, yeah, I want you to imitate God's love, so see it, understand it the best you can, and then copy it and walk in it. So why don't we take that approach this morning? Let's see from these verses all we can in the time allotted about God's love. Let's just dive in and see how it's described here, and then let's make a, um, a real commitment to walking in that. I would say it like this. I'm gonna give you some pastoral instruction about God's love for a bit. And then I'm going to give you some pastoral application about God's love. I'm going to help you, first of all, understand what it is, and then I'll help you understand how we go about it, all right? To the end that we will be imitators of God and walk in love. So from this set of verses, I think there are about four things we can know about God's love. Now, you can search the scriptures, do a systematic study, a topical study on God's love, and find many more. But from these two verses, there are at least four things that are quite motivating about God's love and quite humbling. First of all, notice that God's love is familial. You see the phrase, we are beloved children? Man, I love that this begins his discussion on God's love, and I love the way he describes us. He doesn't just say we're children, does he? He says we're a certain type of child. What does he call us? Beloved children. That's a great um, title. It's a great label, isn't it? It means that, that you are affectionately um, one of God's. Now, notice what he did not say here. He didn't say you paid dues to join an organization. He didn't say that. He didn't say you performed well enough to make the cut and be part of the team. He did not say, um, you know what, you're in the group. None of that language is used. What's used is language that deals with spiritual genetics. Language that deals with divine biology. Birthing language. Son-daughter language. Which means you had nothing to do with your salvation, it belongs to the Lord. Amen and hallelujah. Jonah 2, 7. You see, a lot of times we, we want to say, well, um, you know, it, it, I, I'm, I birthed myself or I'm one of God's children because of me, but what child in here had anything to do with their own physical birth? Not a single one of you. That's why birthdays are misplaced. They should be about the parents, not the kids. Amen. 
I'm kidding. Don't worry, children, kids, teens. The point is, we are God's beloved children. He birthed us by his will, by his power, not by our own flesh and blood. It was God's will that brought us into spiritual existence. And what I love about this is, this idea of affection, it connects to imitation because you don't copy what you don't love and what hasn't loved you. Do you see how he connects imitation to affection? That's how he starts off. So notice, we are something and that's why we do something. The command to walk in love, to imitate, follows the fact that we are beloved children. We've been birthed, born again by God. He spread among and abroad in our hearts the, his love by the Holy Spirit. All this is from God. And so because we are affectionately known by God and belong to God, we now can, because his seed is in us, imitate God. We don't become God. That's not what it says. But we just copy him in our actions and we walk in love. So, so Paul here is not asking you to do something before he's letting you know you are something. Hallelujah. I mean, who needs another long legalistic list? Amen. Amen. But man, when I know who I am, I'm beloved by God. I'm his child by his own will and power and cause. Man, I can get under that and embrace that and enjoy that. And then I see the kind of love it took to make that happen and I can begin to imitate that. Now, can we just be really frank and earnest for a moment? Can I be pastorally transparent about something? I, I think this is theologically accurate, but I think it's physically plain and simple. Like we all know that generally speaking, and I'm gonna be very transparent with you here. We know that generally speaking, loved children end up looking a lot like their parents. We just know that. I'm not speaking here just genetically. We know that happens regardless. <laughs> but environmentally, in regards to habits and, and ways of living, when there's a loving environment, you, you just end up adopting the template you've seen. You do. I mean, I'm experiencing this. I'm watching Julie and she's watching me. And as we grow older, we're saying this to each other more and more. Man, you, you should remind me of your mom. You should remind me of your dad. And she'll say to me, man, you act more and more like your dad as you get older. These are compliments. And you know where they come from? They come from the fact that God in his gracious sovereignty gave Julie just a tremendously loving set of parents. Same for me, a super mom and dad. We both just have the gift of great homes in our backgrounds. And you know what? You find that when you have a loving environment, generally speaking, that's the template you draw from and you look at and you just kind of end up doing things like that. Not all the time and not perfectly and that doesn't mean our homes are perfect. But you do kind of draw on that, that affection in a way of imitation. I've seen this happen in our home and our home wasn't perfect. We made mistakes. But Julie and I tried the best we could just to give our kids a loving, stable, biblical environment. I think if you ask them that, they would say, yeah, for the most part, they did okay, you know. Um, but I've noticed as they're getting older, they're also imitating things that we did that really aren't genetic, but you would think they are. Like the other day, Brianna, she's leaving the drive-thru, uh, and she'd gotten her kids something to drink and eat, and so she puts their drink in their car seat holder or in the cup holder of the car, whichever one. And sometimes, you know, even if you get a larger drink, they can still tip over. And so when we had our kids at home, I would say at every drive-thru, when we'd come out of the drive-thru and then get to the main road, sometimes there's that dip, you know, from driveway to road or other places we're turning into our drive at home. I'd always say, hold on to your drinks. So that went on for like 20 years, okay? It just was a lot of hold on to your drinks, well, Brenda says the other day, she goes, Dad, I gave Clay and Hallie something to drink. I put it in the cup holder and I said, without even realizing it, hold on to your drinks. She goes, what makes me say that? I'm like, I don't know, Brenda, it's not genetic. It's probably environmental. You must have loved it more than you realized, right? <laughs> we laughed about it. We also have noticed our kids saying sometimes as they um, kind of round up their kids to go places, uh, Bethany has four, Brett three, Brenda two, and so when they're all over the house, they'll be rounding up their kids to either leave or perhaps they're going somewhere. 
and they'll say what we said for decades. I'd say this at home a lot. I'd say, hey, we gotta leave at nine, so let's leave at 8.55. And they would say, that's not nine. And I would say, it takes five minutes to get to the car. And they would argue with me. Of course, if you're in Iowa in the winter, you know it takes five minutes to get to the car, right? If you have shoes and coats. And we only have, we have a detached garage, so we just go across the patio and we're there. But sure enough, it was always true. If we wanted to leave at nine, we had to leave the house at 8.55 every time. And, you know, some good humor, some familial mocking would go on for at least 10, 15 years. Guess what my kids are saying to their kids now? Hey, it takes five minutes to get to the car. They're realizing the same thing we knew was true. There's something about the, the way you just kind of imitate those that you, that you generally, you know, felt loved by. And it, the same thing is true spiritually. This is not a hard concept of grace. You've seen it happen in your life. We've seen it happen in our home. When you're, it just happens. And guess what? The same concept is pointed at here by Paul. Because we are loved children and we experience and see how God loves us, we then, because his seed is in us, we will let that flow out of us. It will in some way, watch this, kind of ooze out of us. We'll imitate him and we'll walk in love as well. That's why this is important to know that it is a familial type of love. God loves us as his children. Hallelujah. Notice something else about this love. It's visible. I want you to notice the reference to Christ here. And that Paul seems to be stressing this fact that we can imitate God and walk in love because we've seen how God has loved us. That's why he brings in the idea of Christ uh, loving us into this passage. It's the visible expression of God's love. You ever ask yourself, how do you know God loves you? Well, you can say he loves me in a certain way because of the creation. You're right. He loves me in a certain way uh, through emotion. Yes, you sense it and you feel it, but there's an actual visible expression of God's love in time and space. An historical pinnacle moment that you can point to and say, here's how much God loves me. And it's the cross of Christ and the person of Jesus. God's love is visible to us. Paul points to this in another letter, the letter to the Corinthians, his second one, in which he discusses and says that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, in this verse, he's speaking more generally about God's glory and character. But his point is, if you want to see what God is like, you look to Jesus. So that holds true when it comes to how God loves and what God's love is like. If you want to see what God's love is like, look at Jesus on the cross. And there you will see a love that's incomprehensible, unexplainable, unknown. It's otherworldly. Say, Todd, what do you mean by that? Well, Romans 5 helps us understand some things about God's love. You see, when we love we tend to love those who either like us or who are good to us. That's how humans love. But God doesn't love that way. The Bible says that God actually died for us not because we were good or righteous. He died for us when we were sinners. You see, you know I don't love that way. If we were to see a really rotten person, we wouldn't say, you know what? Let me die in their place so they can stay around. The world needs more rotten people. We wouldn't say that, would we? If you see a really good person or a just person or a righteous person, there may be someone who would say, you know what? I've not been that great in my life. They're a lot better than me. Let me die in their place so they can stay around. There might be a human who would say that, maybe. The Bible says it's scarce, it's rare. But if we were to love in that way, that's how we would think about it. We'd say, you know what? Pick a better person than me. I'll take their place so they can stay here. That's not how God loves and that's not how he loved you when he sent Christ to be the visible expression of his love. The Bible says that while you were still a sinner, God loved you and Christ died for you. Is, is this not just tongue-tying theology? I mean, this is otherworldly love. This is exactly why John would echo Paul. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 
John says this. Do you see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God? Why does John say that? Because he knows that, it was, that, that God loved us when we were sinners. We were enemies of God. We were not reconciled. We were not part of the family. We were not sons and daughters. But God loved us and sent Christ to express that love for us on the cross. And now, is it not amazing that we are called children of God? And I love the way John ends his little verse here. He says, and so we are. (laughs) It's like this, this affirming tag. It's unbelievable, but guess what? It's true. You are a son and daughter of God. Wow, is God's love not great, magnanimous? This is the love he's talking about in these first two verses of Ephesians 5. It's familial, it's visible. We see it in Christ. Notice another thing, it's sacrificial. Paul here tells us that God's love is what... um, enabled Christ to give himself up. Or, I think this is really connected to the word sacrifice later. It's the same expression, the same meaning. Jesus Christ, in a visible way, sacrificed himself. He gave himself up for us. Now, when this word is used, it's pointing to the idea of love, because love is always seen in sacrifice. But we should ask ourselves, what kind of love? You see the word love here mentioned twice, right? We're to walk in love. Christ loved us. We are beloved children, actually three times in one sense. So this sacrifice of Christ, giving himself up, is pointing to a certain type of love. It's agape love. And there are different types of love. You know this. There's friend love. There's romantic love. Uh, There's also divine love, and that's agape love. And agape love, by its definition, means this, that you will sacrifice in order to have someone else receive the highest or higher good. That's agape love. Moms and dads live this way continuously when their kids are home. They're sacrificing so their children can have the higher or highest good. This comes from God's character. It's what the word actually means. And so when it says here that Christ gave himself up, He was a sacrifice. It's agape love. It's love that sacrifices, that gives up for the highest good of someone else. And this was Christ's expression on the cross, sacrificial love. But notice this love is one more thing. This love is personal. Do you see the word us mentioned twice? And so God's love is not just familial. It's not just visible and not just sacrificial. It is also personal, meaning he loved you. Now, the pronoun in the text is us. Can we be really frank here and ask ourselves what or who's the antecedent for us? What does us refer to? Us refers to the church. That does not mean that God doesn't love the world. It does not mean that God doesn't love others. But there is a distinct and discerning and differentiating love that God has for his church. Acts says that it was out of his love for the church that he purchased her with his blood. Ephesians 5 says he's laid down his life for the church. I'll talk more about this on the podcast, Tuesday. I would encourage you to listen to it. I talk about the different types of love that God has, the differentiating discerning types of love. This here is the type of love God has for his church that would cause him to send his own son to be a sacrifice and to purchase the church with his blood for himself. That's amazing love, isn't it, church? So it's personal. I believe this word us does refer to the church collectively, but also It refers to the church individually. There's no reason you can't see the pronoun us and realize, wow, God died for us in the person of Christ, but God died in the person of Christ for me. So it's individual and collective. This is God's love. It's personal. Now, when you think about the personal love of God for you and for the church, understand that 
this sacrificial love that exhibited itself in the visible death of Christ on the cross for the church, for you, means that if God did that, there's nothing else he can't or won't do to ensure his love for his church. Romans 8, 32 testifies to this. Look what it says here. That since God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. So in that verse, Paul's establishing the highest logic. He's saying, okay, here's the greatest form of sacrifice. God did not spare his own son. And then he from there says this. So if he's done that, uh, he'll give us graciously everything else we need. Do you see what Paul's saying? If God has done the hardest and highest thing, why would we doubt he would do everything else? This is how deep the Father's love is for us. This is how wide his love is for us. This is how motivating and changing, life-altering, tongue-tying, stunning, amazing God's love is for his people. It's familial, visible, sacrificial, and personal. Now, there's one last phrase I want us to notice briefly. It does not describe or modify anything about God's love. Do you see how Paul closes this second verse? He says that something was a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What he's describing in this last phrase is really the moment that Christ gave himself up for us. He's modifying here. He's explaining further the nature of Christ's sacrifice. And notice what he says about it. And this is uh, equally stunning. This is otherworldly. This is hard to get your hands around. It's difficult to contemplate. But the Bible here says that when Jesus Christ offered himself up as a sacrifice, it was a fragrant offering, which means God did not fur his brow and pull away and try to get a bad smell out of his nostrils. It means that God saw, and I'm going to use the analogy here, anthropomorphism in play, but just watch this, that God saw and when he smelled the sacrifice of Christ being offered up, he smiled. Why would God consider the offering of Christ's a fragrant offering? Because it was what satisfied God. And because God was satisfied, you can be justified. You see, if you don't have the end of this verse, that Christ was, an, was a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, you don't get the front of this verse. You don't get to be a beloved child. If God's anger and wrath against sin isn't settled, you don't get to enjoy family privileges. But guess who settled it for you? Jesus settled God's wrath and anger against sin he satisfied God and he extends all the benefits to you as a joint heir that's why you can be called a son and a daughter of God as well because of Jesus' work on your behalf so let me just make one more note here that's why this little word is so important will you say it with me two you see Jesus didn't die and offer you his death Jesus didn't die and offer it to Satan. He didn't say, Satan, you're holding my people in ransom. Here's my blood. Can you let them go? Jesus offered his body and blood to the Father to satisfy the Father's wrath against sin. And now, instead of wrath, we enjoy forgiveness. That's because of what Jesus offered to God. So we say this about the sacrifice that Jesus made. It is vertical. And I would say to you, it is primarily vertical. Do you enjoy the benefits of it? Are you the glad recipients of it? By all means, yes. We call upon all men everywhere to repent, to trust in Christ as the only Savior, the only way they'll ever be a child of God by a thousand times yes to that. But you're a recipient of the benefits of Christ's vertical sacrifice to God in which God was forever satisfied 
that sin was now atoned for, and all who trust in Christ can benefit by receiving forgiveness for their sins. Is this love not uh, out of this world? <laughs> Am I the only guy in the room? I'm sure I'm not. I, I, who's, who looks at this and sees this and reads this, and just in two verses, you're left speechless. Like, who loves like this? It's the reason, it's the reason that we say if you want a different kind of life, you've got to know a different kind of love. No one lives, walks in love. You don't put on the new self. You don't take off the old self. You don't adopt and embrace the new sexual ethic in Ephesians 5. None of all of this material happens if you don't know this kind of love. I hope that right now you are finding the words uh, scarce and impossible. Like you don't know how to even describe what you're feeling. I hope that's your situation, that God's love is so overwhelming you that you don't know even how to respond except to humbly say, thank you for making me your child. Because it's that kind of love that you must know and experience to live the different kind of life he's called you to live. So knowing this from the text, can we just again now repeat our take-home realization? And I have a feeling that you're going to be much more passionate about this now. That You've seen this kind of broken out in these two verses. You're like, oh man, this is more true than I realized 20 minutes ago. So you say with me, church, a different kind of life is rooted in a different kind of love, God's. And what is the different kind of life? Let's go to our lab one more time. I just want to show it to you. It's this life of walking in love. Do you see it right there? It's one of the imperatives. It's that life that God has called us to. Imitating imitating God, rooted in his affection for us, our bewilderment at how he does that, and yet our enjoyment of it, and then we now walk in that very love. We're not God. We don't do it perfectly. But in his strength and power, we do aim to walk in the same kind of love that he loved us with. What would that look like? Can I close with just a few minutes of pastoral instruction? I would say a couple of things to you. One is that love must include a component of sacrifice. I would be pastorally negligent if I let you think for a moment that you could walk in love. And Paul here means towards those that we are with in connection with community, like the people around us, that you could walk in love towards them without sacrifice. When the heartbeat of this verse, of these verses, the the real core of the verses is that Christ gave himself up. He was a sacrifice to God on our behalf. So I can't let you leave and think, great. I'll just love and there'll be no sacrifice. You're in for a sacrificial life if you follow Jesus. So that's the road ahead. Now, I also want to say this to you. I think that all of us, since we're on that road, we kind of live on what I call the spectrum of sacrifice. I think everyone's on this. Some of us only know it to a small degree. That's God's privilege to position us there. Some of us know it to a large degree, and that's God's privilege to position us there. We don't always determine where we are on the spectrum of sacrifice. For some of you, it was small, and you got a phone call, and it became large. My point is, we are all on the spectrum of sacrifice, and the question is, how do we live now sacrificially so that we're walking in love. Let me provide a few examples, illustrations, to give you some idea of maybe how we apply this. If I were to take the immediate context of this passage, I would say the first and foremost way that Paul mentions walking in love would be forgiveness. And I talked about this last week exclusively. I won't revisit the message except to say this. Sometimes when we think about forgiveness, we look at it as only absorbing the pain and releasing the, uh, the, the debt or. And that is definitionally true. However, 
all forgiveness, if you search the Bible, and especially God's forgiveness, is aimed at reconciliation. So I want to re-challenge some of you. Don't consider forgiveness just something that you do individually towards someone that technically you're like, hey, but I'll never speak to them again. I've released them, I'll absorb it, but I'm not their friend anymore. <laughs> How can I say this correctly? I, I think the, the, and I want to say the most biblical way, because I think that's probably just the only biblical way, <laughs> but in, in its fullest form, can we say that? Forgiveness has as its aim. Those who used to be enemies are now friends. This is hard preaching. It's hard living. It's hard hearing. But forgiveness isn't just absorbing pain, releasing the, the debt or covering the debt, and then still saying, well, there's massive distance. Do I admit to you at times there are parameters in place and certain things that should be in motion that protect people? I am admitting that. But is that always true? No. There are relationships and situations where forgiveness actually bridges the chasm. And what used to be, um, in, where there used to be enmity, there's now friendship. I recall a man here in this church. We had great strife between us over a period of two or three months. Great strife. Strife that led us to not speaking to each other intentionally. And then one day, just in his truck, we settled and forgave. We absorbed the pain. We released. And you know what? We are great friends today. We have lunch together regularly. We both know what happened. We both know we sinned. And we both have forgiven. And it is so sweet to be in friendship with a man who for a few months actually I didn't even talk to. Now, I'm not the prime example or the best example. I'm saying to you, if you've been thinking about forgiveness all week, and like, okay, my next step, I just want to challenge you that in the immediate context, you walk in love by actually aiming for reconciliation after forgiveness. That's hard. I don't know every situation, but I need to trust you with God's word that you will apply forgiveness to building a bridge so that who, those who were enemies are now friends. I hope you hear that well. That's the immediate context. We could take the first three letters off that word and say that in this text and in the Bible, giving is one of the ways we walk in love. In fact, I think every husband, every wife here would admit with this with me, that there's no love where there's not giving. In fact, John 3.16 spells this out for us, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave. The first response that people usually make when they realize they love someone is a sacrificial gift of some type. It could be time, it could be resources, it could be energy, it could be money, it could be a gift. But there is no love where there's not some aspect of giving. Now you may say, Todd, are you trying to get into my wallet? A little bit. I'm mainly trying to get into your life, which means I want you to give from your wallet, I want you to give from your calendar, I want you to give from your energy, I want your life to be a gift to God and his body. Yes, I want you to give to and through your church financially. I want you to give to and through your church energetically. I want you to give to and through your church with your schedule. And I praise God for how the Lord has gifted our body to really meet our financial needs this year. Above and beyond, I think there's more to do. I love the way God has gifted you to serve in increasingly uh, larger ways. We've seen uh, additional volunteers in a number of areas. Those are, those are great things to rejoice in. But I do think there are still those who are either in the shadows or watching from a distance or, or skeptical. And can I just challenge you to be a part of this family in more ways than with words, but actually begin to give of your life to its mission. That would include resources, time, energy, yeah. But that's what sacrificial love does. It gives. So sacrificial love, walking in love, it's a forgiving kind of walk. It's a giving kind of walk. And lastly, I'd say this, it's a living type of walk. That wherever, wherever you are on this spectrum, you know that that could change in a moment. And you're willing, wherever God in his privilege positions you on the spectrum, to simply continue to sacrifice for whatever the need is, whether it's in your family, in your church, outside of your family. 
mean, we're watching this on, a, on multiple fronts. I'm looking at some of you even right now. I'm talking to some of you who are watching online because you can't be here. I'm thinking about the Ballards, Carol Ballard. She's a wife. You haven't seen her or Monty in probably two plus years, but she just lives just maybe three blocks away from here, maybe five or six, I don't know exactly, but just, just down the road. And she's caring for her terminally ill husband. He has ALS. And unless the Lord intervenes in a miraculous way, in a matter of time, Monty will meet his Lord and Savior. And up until that day, Carol has been just sacrificially caring for him. Day in, day out. I watched my mother-in-law do this as well. My father-in-law took about 10 years to pass away from not ALS, but from dementia and some Alzheimer's issues, a lot involved there. And for about 10 years, she just put her life on hold. She said, I'm going to give up whatever it was because I want to care for you. And you know, you ask these people, is that a begrudging thing they do? Are they resentful? No, it, it's, they can't imagine not doing it. I see Carolyn back there who's cared for Pat since his amputation and just so graciously sacrificing to make sure she cares for him. I know there's folks in this room who have maybe not terminal situations, but there's lingering physical issues. There's illnesses. I think about the DePaulas and their struggle, her struggle with cancer and the treatments. We haven't seen them in a long time because of their cancerous situation is Judah's commitment to caring for her. They got, I think, five children at least. And uh, they just, that, that's a load to carry. And yet, they just sacrifice. I mean, they're on the large end of the sacrificial spectrum. I think about the Mercers, how their life adjusted the minute they found out their son would be born with spina bifida. And so everything changes as parents. If you're firstborn, you're like, okay, so this means this and this means this. The Rose family, usually here at 11, they sit right back over there. Um, and they have a son who's, I think, 20-ish, cerebral palsy. They come in with this tall wheelchair, most services, and they'll sit over there. And then after they're done, they'll wheel him down here. And we pray together, and John and Ann, and we chat. I think about just so many situations like this. Greg and Sherry, their son with Down syndrome, 42 years old. And 42 years, this has been their life. And they've graciously, sacrificially just embraced it. I could go to other smaller situations. I'm not mentioning everyone that we know of or that we're aware of. I just have been thinking about these situations this week. Like this is what it looks like to walk in love. I think about some smaller ones. I'll just mention these to you as well. There's some folks here who have intentionally, and, and they sound almost minuscule compared to what I've just mentioned, so I'm a little hesitant, okay? But there are folks here who have changed small groups on purpose to get to know new people. They've realized, wow, we've got a load of new people in the last eight to nine months. And so they've said, I want to get to know them. I want to help them assimilate better. And so they've just started new groups. They've, they've changed groups. They've left their circle of friends, which is very comfortable, and kind of got into a different circle. I love that. I appreciate that. Should everyone do that? Probably not. We probably would, would want some small groups to stay stable in the same, right? But there's some folks in our church who just who sense, hey, you know what? Let's sacrifice what we know for some folks who are still trying to get to know other people. It's been great to watch. So I just want to remind you, there are all kinds of ways to sacrifice because we're all living on this spectrum of sacrifice. All of us are there. And the Lord positions in you right where he needs you to be at this moment. It's not our decision to say, hey, I don't want to be on here. You are on there. The question is, to whatever, do, wherever you are on that spectrum, will you now walk in love? And that will only happen when you see how you've been loved now listen church family I don't want you to leave this morning thinking wow Todd those are situations both large and small that man, I guess I better get on the ball I got a list of people I got to call and see and things I got to do and I'm feeling you know really convicted and guilty there may be some legitimacy to that I'll leave that between you and the Holy Spirit I don't want you leaving with your primary mindset being man I got a lot to get done there's a lot I got to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave with the mindset that says, wow, I want a clear view of what God has done. Because the seed from which the roots and the tree grow, 
the hinge on which the door swings both directions. The funnel that everything comes in and everything comes out is the incredible, supernatural, amazing, unexplainable love of God for you. And the clearer your view of God's love, the clearer your view of divine love, the sooner you'll walk in a different way. So my prayer for you is that yes, you will walk in a different life, but only because you've been loved with a different love, God's.